All right. Well, I think we have a really cool video, which we might get to show you in a few minutes, but welcome everyone to the Type 1 Virtual Summit. I am Jordan Robinson, your host, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening. I am a T1D myself. I was diagnosed at 23 years old. I'm a sports journalist and broadcaster with an emphasis in women's basketball and women's sports. The WNBA starts tomorrow. Make sure you guys watch. I will be there. I hope you are too. But tonight is the third session of our four-part virtual series titled, Tell Me How You Really Feel balancing mental health and T1D. In recognition of Mental Health Awareness Month tonight, we will be learning practical tips from leading experts, hear personal stories from community members, and put these tips into practice through a mindfulness activity. The Type 1 Nation Summit program offers education, connection, and inspiration on a variety of important topics to help you and your loved ones live well with T1D. Throughout the year, we'll offer virtual sessions like tonight, as well as many in-person summit events hosted by JDRF chapters across the country. If you'd like to stay up to date on our virtual series, please register. We'll post a link in the chat. You can also visit the same link to find an in-person Type 1 Nation Summit event near you. Before we get started, I'd like to extend a special thank you to our national industry partners. Their support helps make the Type 1 Nation Summit program possible. There are so many options available to you and your loved ones as you manage and lessen the daily burden of T1D. JDRF does not endorse any specific product or brand and would encourage you to visit JDRF.org to learn more about all of these options available to you and your family. We also encourage you to speak with your healthcare provider to discuss the options and a treatment plan that would work best for you and your loved one. All right. So with all that being said, you are in for such a treat this evening. If you haven't already done so, please share this link to the session with all of your friends and family Share it with your BFFs, your Facebook groups, on Instagram, everywhere. Please feel free to comment and ask questions in the chat. We'll try to get to as many as possible. We'll also be posting resources in there throughout the discussion. So the chat is the place to be. Make sure you're in there. We have so much to cover this evening, and I will jump right in to introduce our first guest, Yusura Omir. Yusura Omir serves as the coordinator of health policy for the JDRF advocacy team. She comes to JDRF as a T1D of 19 years and hopes her work will help provide broader access to other T1Ds across the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please show a warm welcome to Yusura. Hi, everyone. We're going to get some slides popped up really quickly and then give you a little bit of uh, awesome. There we go. Um, context on the JDRF advocacy team and ways that you can feel empowered and conquering T1D with the community of advocates. So my name is Yusra Omer. I'm the coordinator of JDRF's health policy team, and I'm so excited to be joining you guys this evening to tell you guys a little bit about our work. So let's get started by talking a little bit about the role advocacy plays in the broader JDRF mission. So from securing funding from the federal government to accelerating new technologies and therapies throughout the regulatory approval process, JDRF advocacy engages across the pipeline to ensure critical T1D research maintains its momentum and life-changing breakthroughs can continue to be realized. Furthermore, advances in research need to be accessible, so JDRF is working hard to ensure as many people as possible in the T1D community can benefit from these advancements. Now, let's take a bit of a closer look at the JDRF advocacy team. We are based in Washington, D.C., and are comprised of four teams, grassroots, legislative, regulatory affairs, and my team, health policy. Each team has its own strategically developed goals that contribute to advocacy's overall agenda. And to learn more about our priorities, you can visit jdrf.org slash advocacy. From leading all of the grassroots campaigns and programs and partnering with advocates across the country, as well as lobbying Congress and the administration to ensuring clear and reasonable regulatory pathways for T1D therapies and access to diabetes management drugs and devices, the team works in tandem to help improve the lives of everyone impacted by T1D and get us closer to cures. So we've talked a little bit about our staff and our behind 
that are behind our advocacy work so we can turn our focus to our tremendous network of advocates and the critical work that they're doing across the nation. So JDRF is known on Capitol Hill for our ability to drive our agenda forward and our understanding of the legislative process. But what do JDRF advocates actually do. Um, JDRF advocates meet with federal lawmakers and their staff to discuss matters of significance to JDRF and the T1D community. They take part in action alerts, virtual events, and sign and share online petitions. They tell their personal stories of how T1D has impacted their lives and encourage others to do the same. To help advance our mission, JDRF Advocacy created a number of initiatives which take place locally in Washington, D.C. or online. So let's begin with some of the local in-person initiatives. Uh, the first is the Promise to Remember Me campaign, where JDRF advocates meet with their U.S. representatives and senators in Congress to establish personal relationships and explain how they can help JDRF create a world without T1D. Then we have every electoral cycle, new members are elected to Congress, and many of them are unfamiliar with JDRF and T1D. So the new member outreach initiative gives ad advocates the chance to meet with their newly elected federal legislators and inspire them to support our mission, which we just wrapped up. Then uh, JDRF advocates participate in meetings on Capitol Hill during events like Government Day, which we just had in March, and Children's Congress, which is coming up this July. JDRF Government Day convenes approximately 175 grassroots advocacy leaders in Washington, D.C. each year for four days for information sharing, education, networking, and fellowship. And during the last two days of the conference, advocates take to Capitol Hill. During Children's Congress, more than 160 youth with T1D head to Washington, D.C., and they these budding advocates are given opportunities to sharpen their leadership skills, to learn from high-profile public figures living with T1D, and to meet with members of Congress to explain what it's like to live with T1D and to advocate for continued federal support. Virtual campaigns also play an essential role in fulfilling JDRF's advocacy mission and are extremely effective. One benefit of virtual campaigns is that there are no logistical limitations and advocates located anywhere in the country can lend their voices and make a difference for the community. Our work in this space can include advocates taking action on an alert by reaching out to members of Congress and urging support, signing a petition, or engaging in social media campaigns. JDRF is so proud of its many advocacy accomplishments and the impact they've had on the T1D community, all of which are a direct result of the tremendous work done by grassroots advocates and staff throughout the organization. Just to name a few here, um, our accomplishments include FDA approvals, such as t if you've heard of it, measures to reduce the cost of insulin, and successfully securing critical research dollars. If you haven't already, uh, please make sure to sign up to be an advocate online at jdrf.org slash join. It takes just a minute or two to register and being an advocate is such a rewarding, empowering experience and everyone can do it. Once you've signed up to be an advocate, you'll receive information from the advocacy team on key issues we're working on and action alerts that specify ways in which you can help. We currently have two action alerts that are live, so you can visit jdrf.org slash support SDP and jdrf.org slash insulin act to take action. As mentioned previously, there are a number of virtual and local grassroots campaigns led by JDRF Advocacy, and both JDRF Advocacy staff and volunteers are highly encouraged to participate. Finally, JDRF Advocacy needs help spreading the word about the various ways that T1D families can get involved, so be sure to follow at JDRF Advocacy on social media and amplify our posts. So our nationwide network of JDRF advocates are the backbone of JDRF's advocacy program, and we hope you'll consider joining us. We're getting closer to cures for T1D every day, and we always thank you for your support. And that is all I have for today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join and share a little bit of information about our advocacy efforts. Please don't hesitate to reach out to our team should you have any questions or if you'd like to get involved. Thanks again. Thank you so much, you Sarah. Wow. I I feel like as a type one diabetic, we are advocates just in our own households and in in our own families, but you are out there doing the Lord's work and being advocates for all of us. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. No, thank you guys. And it's really easy for everyone to get involved with or without T1D. So we're excited to kind of spread the wealth and love so we don't have to be doing all the work on our own um, and making sure that T1Ds have people rooting for them on every step of the way. I love it. Well, thank you for all your work and thank you for being with us today.
All right. So we are moving right along. That was incredible. I encourage you to hop into the chat and sign up if you haven't already. But I wanted to introduce our next guest, Caitlin Kinnanen. She is a Tony nominated Broadway television and film actress known for originating the character of Emma Nolan in the Broadway production, The Prom. Caitlin began acting at the young age of three and by 11, she had already performed in her first professional show in the theater theatrical production of Annie. At 16, Caitlin moved to New York and made her Broadway debut in Spring Awakening. She has since appeared in numerous productions, including Our Ladies Pilot for CW, The Intern, Sweet Little Lies, It's Kind of a Funny Story, We Need to Talk About Kevin, Younger, American Vandal, The Nick, and Law and Order SVU. I know there's some Law and Order fans in the crowd. Caitlin's versatility doesn't end with her acting skills. Her remarkable voice can be heard as Juniper on the podcast, The Callisto Protocol Helix Station, featuring Gwendolyn Christie. She is also nominated for an Audi Award for narrating the auto book Mary Jane and was handpicked by Judy Bloom to narrate her book forever. Today, she joins us to share her personal story and mental health journey. Please welcome Caitlin. Think you're on mute. There you go. Hi. <laughs> How gotcha. are you? I'm so good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming back. I know you were here um, last time for our ton summit, but I'm so excited to be with you. Let's just jump right in because you sure. have an incredible story and you do so many things, which I love. You're so talented. But share a little bit about your personal journey. Like, when did you discover your love for acting and how has T1D kind of impacted those dreams? Yeah. Um, so as you said in that lovely introduction, <laughs> um, I started acting when I was three years old because my older sister was also taking acting classes and I wanted to follow in her footsteps. Um, it's like, that's cool. Let's do that, too. And so I started taking all of these acting classes in the community I grew up in. And I was diagnosed with diabetes when I was eight years old. And it kind of threw a curveball into everything because mm -hmm. it's a learning experience. And we didn't know what it was. We didn't know how it would affect me. We didn't know anything really. And so for a while there, I wasn't able to do theater. I wasn't able to do the thing that I loved most. And then we figured it out. It all like calmed down a bit and we realized, oh, I can still do this. I can still pursue acting and do the thing that I love to do because just because I have diabetes doesn't mean I can't do what I love. So we found the balance and we kept going and I'm still doing it today, 23 years later. <laughs> it's all about balance, isn't it? Because I think we're all just trying to figure out the balance and how T1D kind of fits into that. But I know last time you shared a beautiful tribute to the late award winning actress and T1D champion Mary Tyler Moore back in March during Women's History Month. As you know, her documentary, Being Mary Tyler Moore, is premiering on HBO and will be available to stream May 26th. Little plug there. Let's take a look at the trailer. <laughs> yes. Was the wife you played kind of an idealization of the American wife? There is no such woman. Most I of them are wretched so. bags. Yes, I think we all have our moments. Laura Petrie broke down and cried. She was nasty and short-tempered. And she was also sweet and soft, and she was many things. Oh, no. I, I think she was sort of a, a strained idealization of the American woman, as she thinks she is, but they had no connection with reality. Mary Tyler Moore was America's sweetheart. Hardly anybody knows comedy like she does. She was just masterful, but she was also incredibly inventive. It's just that I couldn't go to a party knowing my son was on the verge of being sick. Carl Reiner saw some spark of humor in me, and he started writing for me to be funny. She was on the side of risk-taking. Her morphing into Mary Richards was such a feminist statement. Mary Tyler Moore Show hired the most women and it changed the language of television. Women speak differently and we have different ideas and we have different stories. May you have the pleasure and joy working with Mary Tyler Moore. You were kind of locked up. The image on the screen never matched the real Mary. She was no stranger to adversity. 
I had a miscarriage, and when I was in the hospital, they discovered that I had diabetes. When Richie died, that really changed her. Just because you have a smile on your face doesn't mean you're not ready to go to battle. I believe in tomorrow. I believe that things that are painful will not be as painful in some time. It's not the end of the world if I'm not perfect. Mary spoke to all of us. Women could have careers, could stand on their own two feet. Mary, we love you very much. Her seven Emmy Awards, her three Golden Globe Awards, and her Academy Award nomination are only the beginning of the story. I think she was meant to spark fire with a very delicate match. Women are, or should be, human beings first, women second, wives and mothers third. It should fall in that order. All right, get your popcorn ready. I mean, what? What are also get your incre- tissues ready? Oh my god! So many things. I mean, what an incredible story. And I feel like you have a special connection to this as an actress, as a woman who she was really um, trying to show how women are so multifaceted on yes. screen and off, and then being a type one diabetes champion on top of that so when you watch that trailer what how do you feel I mean like overwhelmed with possibility because she was so vocal about we can do anything Mm -hmm. you know we aren't just mothers we aren't just type 1 diabetics we aren't just actors we're all we're all of the things um and I think that that message is so important and something that I take to heart always um yeah she's she's incredible she's Mary Tyler Moore like come on (laughs) so yeah just like possibility that leaves me with so much hope and so much like aspiration to support other people support myself keep doing the thing keep doing the thing because she did a lot of things make sure that you guys stream that May 26 on max I'm going to be watching. I can't wait. But I want to hear more about your story, Caitlin, because as an LGBTQ actress living with T1D, what challenges, because I know there are challenges just <laughs> in living, existing for all of us, what barriers have you encountered and how have you, how have they impacted you mentally and how have you overcome them? I mean, what a can of worms to get into. I know, right? (laughs) Um, There's so many facets to every single aspect of that. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think like overall, it's been really interesting over, I had been living in New York, um, been there the last 15 years. I made my Broadway debut in 2008. um, And it was a different time then. I remember going to the audition for the show that I ended up doing Spring Awakening and hiding my diabetes Mm -hmm. and saying like, I don't want them to know that I have this because they may not hire me. They may be scared of it. They may not know what to do with it. And so I remember like going to the dance call and like unhooking my pump and hiding it in my bag and like not letting anyone know that this was a part of me. Mm -hmm. Whereas now it's so a part of me and I am not afraid to say that and I'm not afraid to show up in spaces and own that and say like yes I have diabetes um and just like I'm not afraid anymore of saying like you know what I'm actually low right now I need to go get a fruit snack um and just embracing all of that and I think that you know no matter what group you are a part of you know whether it's being bi like myself, being a diabetic, there's there will, will always be struggles that you will have to go through. But I think being true to yourself and honest with yourself mm-hmm. and honest with the people around you will do you better in the long run, no matter what. And I, I just have a question because I know that I personally struggle some days when you feel like there was nothing, especially with T1D, there's nothing that we did to get this right and I I got diagnosed at 23 so I had 23 years before this and I'm like I'm an athlete I eat I take care of my body what how did I how do you kind of get through those days when you're like man this came on to me I didn't do anything to get this how do you kind of break through on those days that's such an interesting uh 
question that like I'm actually kind of like grappling with as we speak yeah (laughs) um because you know you say like you were 23 when you were diagnosed I was eight and I had no idea what it was I didn't know what was happening and no one at that point in my life really explained it they were like you've got diabetes okay what does that mean (laughs) what does that mean to an eight-year-old and so I'm realizing as an adult that like there's a lot of my childhood that like has these missing like pieces to it Mm. because I just you know we went into like fight or flight survival mode and just made it through whereas it's like now it's like yeah how do you show up with that how do you show up and say like yes I have this thing but I didn't do it Mm -hmm. to myself Mm -hmm. no one does this to themselves and I think that's one of like the great misconceptions about diabetes is that like oh we ate too many donuts it's like no, no, that has nothing to do with it. Um, you're full, complete beings that just like happen to have this happen to them. And I don't know, wrapping your brain, your brain around that is incredibly difficult and yeah. profound. And I think that like, I try to tell myself really like, take it a day at a time and be kind to yourself because you did not do this to yourself be kind, you Mm -hmm. know, forgive yourself for your mistakes, celebrate your wins, but know that like, no one does this perfectly. No one does life perfectly, let alone life with type one diabetes. So like, give yourself some grace, let yourself mess up. Tomorrow's a new day. We can try again. Might be better, might be worse. We'll deal with it then. (laughs) It's really a toss up. I love that so much. I think I needed to hear that. And I'm sure so many people watching and listening needed that reminder that we have to sometimes give ourselves as T1Ds and just give ourselves a a good little hug. Like you're trying your best, (laughs) you're doing it. But I know as an actress, and especially when you're on stage, there are, you know, long hours and rehearsals and trying to balance that life and that lifestyle with your T1D lifestyle how has that kind of affect your mental health and how have you been balancing? I mean, another great question. How have I? <laughs> We're all trying. Give yourself a hug first. <laughs> We're all trying. We're all trying. We're all trying. Um, no, I think that goes back to like really owning it and knowing that like in my kindness to myself and protecting my mental health and making it so that like I don't just go crazy over like nitpicking every single detail of my life as a diabetic because it's so easy to follow and fall into that. It's like my numbers aren't perfect. This carb count isn't right. All of those things, giving yourself grace and then like owning it. You know, when I show up in a work environment now, one of the first things I do is I go to whoever is in charge, whether if it's theater, it's a stage manager, Mm -hmm. whether it's film and TV and assistant director, you go to the people and I tell them flat out, I'm like, hey, I'm a type 1 diabetic. This is what's going on. This is what I have in my bag. This is what you need to be aware of. I've got this. Don't worry about it. Just know I may at some point be like, I have to go deal with this and let me go deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think finding that voice within yourself is really hard to do. Walking up to someone and telling them all of that is so nerve wracking. But like Mm -hmm. the more I do it, the easier it becomes and so it's really about like kind of ties in with advocacy that like you have to advocate for yourself yeah you know and I think that goes for like showing up at work I think it goes for showing up with your friends I think that can be really challenging and it's something that people don't talk about but like most of the time we are ourselves the only diabetic in a group of people you know Mm -hmm. and so showing up with your friends and being like guys I feel like crap today because my blood sugars have been all over the place or I was low last night and just talking about it, just saying what's going on will help. So I'm a Mm -hmm. huge, just advocate for yourself, be honest with yourself and be honest with those around you because it will make everything easier. I love, I want to like make little cute little pamphlets that I can just (laughs) hand out as soon as I get to set like, Hey, I'm a T1D. Here's everything you need to know. And I can put little yeah. stickers or something exactly. on it. Exactly. <laughs> because people see, like, they'll see your insulin pump. They'll see your CGM. And, of course, like, they either – it's always interesting because they either, like, ask the question and they're like, oh, my gosh, is that a pager? Or they don't ask <laughs> the question and then they just sit there like, 
Yeah. <laughs> staring at it. And you're like, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about it and get it over with. It'll make it easier for everybody. For everyone involved. I am a new insulin pump user and, you know, I'm on set and we were, you know, getting hooked up with mics and I was so nervous. I like practiced my speech. I was like, oh no, is this going to like cross wavelengths or something? Can it be next to my pump and the, and the speaker? And he was like, it's fine. We could just put it on the other side. I was like, woo, good thing I practiced my speech on the way over here. But just having to talk about it and, you know, putting all that out there, I think, Sometimes there's a stigma when it comes to mental health and T1D and breaking down that stigma is very important. T1D and diabetes are, are often looked at as, as the invisible disease, right? Because no one can just look at us and know everything that we're battling. So based on your experience, how can we help increase understanding and create a more supportive environment for T1Ds, especially teens? and young adults struggling with their diagnosis because there's also body image burnout there's all of these things that go into that as well that's constantly on our minds yeah um again what a can of worms um (laughs) these are really easy questions caitlin i mean (laughs) but i feel like a broken record because like for me it truly does come down to like being your own advocate Mm -hmm. and like the way we break stigma is to talk about it the way we make it easier for ourselves is to educate the people around us. You know, so many, so many people just don't understand. And if you communicate with them, if you have the conversation, they will begin to understand and they will begin to like see your invisible illness Mm -hmm. and they will be able to see how it affects you, what different things do. It just, the more you speak up for yourself, the easier it will be for you and for other people to help you. And like, especially like the mental health aspect of all of it is so important. And the more you don't talk about it and the more you hide and the more you just like shell yourself away, Mm -hmm. the harder it's going to be and the lonelier it's going to be and the scarier it's going to be. And so it, it may be at first scary to talk about it and you may have to rehearse those speeches and like like okay I gotta prep myself to tell this sound person that I have an insulin pump now but then it makes a moment of like oh it's not an issue Mm -hmm. all of that worry and all of that fretting and all of that like scaredness I didn't need to have that because we just talked about it so yeah I think stigma and talking about it are like directly linked Mm -hmm. so like shout it from the rooftops be who you want to be be who you are and just like share your share your diabetes with people. Amazing. Well, before I let you go, here's your time to plug. Do you have any <laughs> upcoming projects, initiatives? What's going on that you can share? Um, well, I'll be signing up for that diabetes advocacy for JDRF for Same. sure. So like that. <laughs> um, I was so happy to learn about that. I was like, cool. Um, and then I've got I'll have two um audiobooks coming out later this year that I'm really excited about. One is called um, Picture Perfect Boyfriend, and the other one is called Borrow My Heart. Um, They're both beautiful, fun, romantic comedies. Um, So those will be coming out soon. And that's it. That's, That's what I'm doing right now. So fun. Okay, where can people follow you and find you on socials? Plug those two. Um, Instagram, just at Caitlin.Cannonin. Super easy. It's where I post all my stuff and be my goofy, wacky, proud, diabetic self. <laughs> She's a great follow, you guys. I personally follow her. It is a really, <laughs> really good follow. She did not pay me to, to say that, but... Thank you so much, Caitlin. Thank you for sharing your story. I, as a storyteller, stories are so um, important and so, you know, sensitive. So thank you for sharing your words with us. I feel encouraged and I hope everyone does too. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. We're just getting started, you guys. There's so much more to come. That was incredible. Thank you, Caitlin, for sharing your wise words. We are going to introduce our next guest, Our next guest is Dr. Mark Heyman. Dr. Heyman is a diabetes psychologist and a certified diabetes care and education specialist. He is the CEO of the Center for Diabetes and Mental Health in San Diego. He is passionate about providing diabetes education and evidence-based mental health treatment and online programs to people with diabetes. 
Mark received his PhD in clinical psychology from the George Washington University and completed his psychology internship at the UCSD School of Medicine. He is the host of the podcast Live Free with T1D and the author of Diabetes Sucks and You Can Handle It, Your Guide to Managing the Emotional Challenges of T1D. Mark has been living with type 1 diabetes since 1999. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Heyman. Thank you so much, Jordan. It's great to be here with all of you. And I am looking forward to chatting with you. I have to say, though, you know, listen to Caitlin. I recorded my audiobook a couple months ago and talk about a nerve wracking experience, both actually recording it and trying to talk slowly and clearly, but also my pump was like beeping and they had, we had to <laughs> redo a bunch of stuff because I heard all these <laughs> alerts and alarms going off and those can't be on an audiobook. So, <laughs> you know, awesome, Caitlin, to hear about that. Uh, that work. So anyway, to, so today we're, I'm going to be talking about um, some tips and tricks for you around your mental health with type one diabetes and how you can, what you can do to, to reduce the stress. You know, for, b- before I begin, I want to say that, you know, I don't have a magic wand and I don't have a way to make the stress of type one diabetes go away. And I think that just like Jordan and Caitlin were talking about a minute ago, the more you fight it, the more challenging it gets. And so part of the way that I look at mental health is, you know, we have this stress and diabetes does suck um, and you're able to handle it. You're able to handle that stress. And so if we try to look at our emotional health type of diabetes, not as something we want to make go away. Not a, we want, don't want to make all the burden go away, but we want to gain skills to be able to handle it. Um, we're going to be in a much better spot than if we try to make it go away because it just doesn't work very well. So I want to introduce to you what I call the three pillars of emotional health with type 1 diabetes. Um, and I, th- I, b- I really believe that if we have these three pillars, then you're going to be in a really good spot to be able to handle the stress and make the stress, um, you know, be able to handle it better and be able to ha- make it easier for you to deal with. And those three pillars are education, mindset, and behavior. And we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these individually. So as those of, as all of us know, ima- imagine for a second that you are newly diagnosed, or maybe you are newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and no one tells you anything about how to manage it. You're completely lost. It's going to be really anxiety provoking. You have no idea what makes your blood sugar go up, what makes your blood sugar go down. Um, and you're going to feel really unsteady on your, on your feet. I've heard people describe this, this situation as feeling like you're drinking out of a fire hose. And you're like, you just don't have, don't have your balance. And that's the big picture. On the smaller picture, you know, figuring out how to bolus for pizza or how to bolus for a burrito. Um, those, are, those are things that are challenging that you really want to educate yourself on. And, and, and get guidance on it if you can't figure it out. Because the more you know about diabetes and how to manage it, but more importantly, how, what, the more you know about your own diabetes and how you manage it, the more stable you're going to feel and the less anxiety that you're going to feel. And so I want to give you some tips that you can use to understand diabetes better. The first is, you know, lean on your healthcare team. You know, diabetes is never a do-it-yourself condition. And Hopefully, you have a healthcare team that's there to support you, both from a blood sugar management point of view, but also from an emotional point of view, and to be able to ask questions and to get guidance. Um, I really believe that you are the captain of your diabetes management healthcare team. Um, They're there to guide you, coach you, and show you the best way forward. Um, And if they're telling you what to do, um, telling you, you know, this is what you must do. If you don't, you're a quote unquote bad diabetic, I would fire them. Um, But really lean on your healthcare team to be able to understand diabetes better, ask them questions, be able to, you know, ha- have them guide you in the way that you want to live your life, not letting diabetes dictate that, but allowing you to do that. But your healthcare team can do that. Um, talk to trusted peers with type one diabetes, um, whether it's here in the chat, whether it is in a Facebook group or whether it's in an, in, in, an in-person um, meetup uh, to be able to get strategies to, strategies to understand you know, how, what works in the real world, you know, there's one, it's one thing what, what works in a textbook or what works, you know, for, for people in theory, but in reality, we want to be able to learn from each other about what we do to manage our diabetes better and understand our diabetes better. And, and, and leaning on our peers is important and always be open to learning more. You know, I've been living with type one diabetes for almost 24 years. It'll be 24 years in two weeks. And 
I do this for a living and I am always learning more things about type one diabetes and how to manage it both from, excuse me, the research, but also from my patients, people I work with, people I talk to on a regular basis. And so thinking that you know it all is probably one of the biggest mistakes that you can make as you're learning to understand diabetes better. So always be, always be willing to open, or sorry, always be willing to learn more about type one diabetes, how to manage it and how your body is working there. Your mindset is also a key pillar to your mental health with type one diabetes and a key part of a strategy for managing the stress. Um, you know, your mindset enc encompasses what you do with your thoughts and your emotions and your experience with diabetes. Um, so we can't change our thoughts and our emotions and our experience necessarily. I, I've tried to change my thoughts many times or, or, or make my emotions go away. And trust me, it does not work. But what you can do is you can change how you catch those thoughts and what you do with them, how you um, deal with those emotions when they, when they do come. And when you're able to do that, um, it's going to change your experience of living with diabetes. It's going to change your mindset and it's going to change the lens that you see diabetes through. And so changing your mindset is a key part, and, and well, I should say paying attention to your mindset and changing it if necessary is a key part of that process. So what can you do to change your mindset? Um, it, we have a, a short period of time here, so we don't have a lot of time to really dive into this stuff. But the first is to identify three things. Uh, or three buckets, I should say. Identify what you can control um, about type 1 diabetes, um, what you can influence, and also what you cannot control. Um, so for example, what can you control? Well, you can control how much insulin you take. You can control what you're eating. You can control if and when you exercise. Um, you can control what you say to other people. What can you influence? Well, you can influence your blood sugars. You can't control them completely because sometimes they're gonna go wacky or you, you can't just hit it on the nose, but you can influence your blood sugar. You know that if you take insulin right now, more likely than not within an hour, your blood sugar is gonna go down. If you eat a high carb meal right now, more than likely your blood sugar is gonna go up. You can influence that. And then what can't you control? Um, you wanna identify those things. And really what you cannot control are, are other people and how they treat you. You can't control necessarily your thoughts and your emotions in the moment. You can influence them, but you can't necessarily control them. And recognizing that and being honest with yourself about that is, is key to managing the stress of type 1 diabetes. And then finally, and maybe even the, maybe the most important thing in my mind is your behavior. Um, and this is as a third pillar. So my guess is, is that if you could do whatever you want to do with diabetes, if diabetes did not get in the way of anything in your life, of your relationships, your job, your school, your hobbies, your dream, hopes and dreams, then it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Certainly it would be annoying. It would, wouldn't be very much fun necessarily, but you say, I can deal with that. But what the biggest challenge that we have is that when diabetes gets in the way of the things that we want to be able to do, you know, I want to take my daughter to the park and play with her. I want to be able to go skiing. I want to be able to go on a long uh, uh, camping trip or go hiking, but I can't because of my blood sugars. Um, and sometimes that's realistic because your blood, if your blood sugar is low or really high, maybe you should hold off on that hike for half an hour. But part of it is our mindset. Our, our mindset tells us and our, our mind tells us that diabetes is getting in the way of my life. And what would happen if we were able to change that mindset and, and therefore change our behavior and allow us to do what we want to do, even though diabetes is there? So how do you change your behavior? Um, the first thing to do is identify what is standing in your way. Um, is it your thoughts? Is it your emotions? Or is it really your blood sugar? Or maybe it's somebody else telling you that you can't do something or you, that you shouldn't do something. Um, the next thing I want to encourage you to do is make sure you don't let your emotions call your thoughts, call the shots. How often have you told yourself, I will go swimming when I feel less burned out, or I will go for a walk when my anxiety goes away. So what you're doing there is you're letting your emotions call the thoughts, shots. You're saying, I'll, I'll, I'll do the behavior when I feel a certain way. And we know it doesn't work that way. Um, you, you don't, you can't change your emotions and you can't control them, especially in the moment. So if you're letting your emotions call your shots, you're saying, I'll, I'll do this when I feel this way. What if instead you led with action and you said, I'm going to do this 
even though I feel, well, no matter how you feel, I'm going to go for a walk, even though I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to um, change my pump side, even though I'm feeling burned out. Um, that's leading with action. And that is something you have complete control over. So I want to, um, you know, open this up to questions. I know that we're, I think we're going to get back on uh, together, me and Jordan, to, to talk about this. But I also want to invite you to, um, I, I developed, the, developed a new resource. Um, I, starting on June the 1st, I'm going to be starting out, so I'm going to be sending out an email uh, with a tip of the day. And if you're interested in that, it's completely free. Um, I want to invite you to uh, check out this website, thediabetespsychologist.com forward slash tip of the day, and you can sign up for that. But I want to also make sure we have time to answer questions that you may have um, about the emotional burden um, and how to manage the emotional burden of type 1 diabetes. So thank you for joining me. And um, I know that we're going to have some time for some questions right now. I'm jotting down that <laughs> that website so that I can make sure to sign up for that tip of the day. Thank you so much, Dr. Heyman. That was incredible information. We have one question here from Diana. Ideas to help avoid burnout. This is something that I know we all have. And sometimes I just don't even want to look at my numbers. I don't want to look at my pump. Don't even say the word diabetic around me. I just need a break because I feel burnt out. So how can we manage that? So the first thing I'm going to say is probably a little bit counterintuitive, and that is that burnout is completely normal. And I would actually, I don't hope you feel burned out, but I, I expect everybody with type 1 diabetes to feel burnt out at some point. Um, because who wouldn't? You're living with a condition that requires constant management. And so let's normalize burnout. Let, let, let's, let, let's not say, you know, I'm, I'm bad or I'm, I'm different or I'm whatever because I feel burnt out. How about you own it and say I'm normal? Now, now, once we do that, then all of a sudden it frees up burnout and it takes away the stigma of having it, which is probably half the problem or half the challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and once we're able to do that, then, then we can talk about, you know, what can we do to reduce that burnout? Um, and I think that there are a couple of things. The first, the, the, the first thing is give yourself some grace and, and, and you don't have to be working all the time. You know, focus on the thing, the actions, the behaviors and your diabetes management that really matter. They are going to have the biggest impact and, you know, give yourself some grace with the, with the other stuff. So for example, I know that the, for me, the biggest impact that I can have on my, on my blood sugars is not eating many carbs before noon. And if I do that, then the, then no matter what I do the rest of the day, things are going to be usually fairly smooth. Um, mm -hmm. And so it, when I'm feeling burnt out, what I do is I focus on that. I focus on, okay, I'm going to focus on my mornings and then the rest of the day, I'm going to give myself a little bit of slack. Um, and recognize that, that that's that for me that works. And then what happens is that I'm feeling less burned out later on, and I'm more um, motivated to manage my diabetes. And it makes it easier to do those things. So pick pick those behaviors. Um, mm. Also seek support. Um, recognize that you're not alone, and that feeling burnt out is normal. And it's also constantly changing. Um, and so you say if you if you say I I am burned out. Well, I'm not sure that you are burned out, but you're certainly feeling that way. But that burnout is changing constantly throughout the day. It may not feel like it, um, but just like your dex, if you have a if you have a flat line on your CGM, um, you say, "Well, my blood sugar has been one one ten all day long." Well, it really hasn't. It's been changing up and down. If you if you take your finger and and, and take it along your phone, you'll see those those changes. The same thing is true for your burnout. And and if burnout can change, that gives you hope, even if it's changing to the to the downside. Um, that means that it can actually come back to the upside. The the, the I worry more when we're saying but my burnout is constant um, because then if it can't change, then all of a sudden now you're stuck with it. And mm. that is a mindset that's just simply not true. Mm. Wow. That is, that is so good. Just changing that little shift in, in your brain. And I like what you said too, just focusing on one thing when you are feeling that that can really help. Do we have any other questions? Okay. Hey, Dr. Heyman, I've been a T1D for 22 years and I turned 36 today. How have you found it's best to manage expectations of your care of your condition and not get so frustrated when you struggle at a certain time to manage it how you want to, to get better at striving to stay focused and not letting struggles, burnout, getting in the way of your life with T1D? Uh, that's a great question. So... What, here's what I'm going to say. I, I, so I'm, I'm going to, I don't know if this is the, if this is the exact question that you're asking, but I'm going to give it, give an example. So many times I see people, I talk to people with diabetes and I, and they, they say, 
I am doing horribly with my diabetes. My diabetes is in the, it's just in the, in the my, my blood sugars are on the toilet. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Tell me, give me, give me some examples. And I said, well, my time in range is 85%. And, and I, I, I can't help but laugh because I don't think my, my time in range has ever been 85% <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for more than a couple of days. Yeah. Um, and so I think we need to reframe what it means to have good diabetes management, what that, what that actually looks like. So if we're able to, so I'll be very, very open here. My time in range this last week was 68%. Um, and, you know, and that's actually pretty good. But I, and, and I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that for, to, to compare, for you to compare to anything, but I want you to recognize that a 70% or more time in range is actually in really, you're doing really well. If you have an 80% time in range, you're a rock star. If you have 90% time in range for more than, a, more than a couple of days, you're a unicorn. <laughs> and, um, I think we have a misconception that, you know, that managing diabetes well means being perfect. And mm. that is simply not true. I um, mean, anyone who says that they're perfect with their diabetes is either delusional or, li- delus- delusional or lying to you. Um, mm. There's just no, no way around that. So, um, you know, I want you to recognize, you know, what do you expect from yourself from your blood sugars and what is reasonable to expect from yourself? And that's a conversation with an honest conversation with your doctor, as well as seeing what is normal for people with diabetes. Um, mm. And another thing is recognizing what do you expect from yourself from your behavior? Um, you know, so you say, well, I'm going to be carb free for the next week. Well, good luck. I mean, (laughs) what happens if you go low or what happens if you want to have a cookie? Um, those things are okay. And giving yourself some grace in that, but, but also setting expectations for yourself about what you want to do and what's important for you to do, not what you think you should do. Um, I think the the difference between should and want to, and, and, and willing to is, is really important. And again, it, it all comes back to one thing that I think is really important with diabetes is, and that, that, that's flexibility. Flexibility in how you think about your diabetes, how, flexibility in what, you, what is quote unquote good. Um, because we, if we get stuck in this place of like, I, I'm not doing very well and I'm burned out and I'm, I'm, I'm miserable, mm-hmm. then we're stuck there. If yeah. you're flexible and you're able to see that, wow, I'm, I'm doing better today than I was yesterday, or I'm feeling better today than I am today, or that I, it's okay if I'm out of range sometimes or a lot of time, um, that's going to put you in a much better place mentally. And surprisingly enough, it's going to put your blood sugars in a much better place in the long run, in the long run. I believe that. I believe there's correlation there of how you are feeling mentally and how your blood sugars kind of react to that. Thank you so much for sharing that answer. Do we have one more question? Let's see if it pops up. I have one if we don't if we don't have another one because I'm full of questions. That's my job. (laughs) Well, I was going to say one someone mentioned in the chat that sometimes the mental aspect of it is the hardest to explain. It's the hardest Mm -hmm. to explain to someone when you say, yes, this is the disease that I have. And yeah, we have a pump and all of that, but the mental aspect. So how do you kind of advise starting that conversation with even family members or someone close? If it's like, yes, my blood sugars are low, but I'm actually just, I'm having a bad day mentally. And it's been a streak of bad lows. Or how do you advise just starting that conversation? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a good one because it's invisible. And, and, no, and if you don't get it, you don't get it. Um, so I think the first thing that I would like, I would encourage you to do is sit down and make a list of all of the things about diabetes that are challenging for you mentally. Um, you know, and, and that can include the highs and the lows and kind of the, the constant worry about your blood sugars and looking at your CGM and the data overwhelm and the, you know, the burnout and the anxiety about the future and the, the anxiety about tomorrow and the anxiety about today and, and just mm-hmm. write it all down. And then, I mean, and maybe even t- go and give your friend or friend or family member that list and say, let's talk, let me, let's, let's use this as a starting point to talk about how this is so challenging. Because right in a perfect world where you just take your insulin, eat healthy, exercise regularly and check your blood sugar, like it seems like a check the box condition, but you and I both know that it's not. And so, but let's talk really honestly with our friends and family about what that actually looks like and why it's not. And I think that's a good starting point and really be open at answering their questions without getting defensive about it. I think that, you know, we, we feel like we have to explain ourselves and we have to convince people, but say, you know, this is hard for me. And they say, well, why is it so hard? And, and you say, well, look at this list and just know that it's hard. You know, if you said that, that test was hard or that, that job, that task at work was hard, I wouldn't argue with you. So why are you, why are you getting defensive with me about the fact that what I'm saying, diabetes is hard? Mm-hmm. Um, 
And it is. And if you ha- if, if they really don't understand that, then give them my book. Um, that will convince them that diabetes is hard, but also that there are things that you can do as a person with diabetes and a person and some things that they can do as a supporter of you to make it easier. Um, and, you know, I wish we had time to go into all those specifics here, but, um, you know, I would encourage you to give them my book. I, I've heard lots of feedback that it's a great resource for friends and family members. Hmm. Thank you so much, Mark. You have been incredible. Great plug for the book at the end. Everybody (laughs) needs to get it. Go buy it right now. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your wealth of knowledge with us. You're very welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are moving on to our final guest. I am so excited to talk to Sam Tolman, MPH. Sam is one of the facilitators and co-founders of the Diabetes Sangha. Diagnosed with T1D at eight years old, he has been on a long arc of trying to understand the human experience and learning how to support meaningful and helpful experiences ever since through the lens of both science and meditative practice. He is a dedicated student of Rinzai Zen, but draws heavily in his practice from other Buddhist traditions and modern Western uh, psychology and neuroscience. In his professional life, he serves as head of clinical research for cyber health, creating mind-body-computer interfaces to help people connect with what's most important in their lives. Please join me in welcoming San Tolman. Hey, thanks, Jordan. Hey, Sam. I feel like we need to make that intro more low key. That that was a little <laughs> bit much. <laughs> hey, we are not dimming your light. You are incredible. You have done so much incredible things. So we got to make sure to shout it from the rooftops. It's fun to be here. I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being here. Okay, let's jump into it. We have quite a few questions to get through. So let's just start out. What is Sangha and how did you come to learn about it? Yes. So Sangha is a Sanskrit word, actually. And, and uh, it might seem kind of foreign to us at the start, but it's really actually just a word for community. Um, mm. And it's a word for a particular kind of community. So you might say, okay, why didn't you just call it diabetes community? Um, so we call the organization Diabetes Sangha because a Sangha is a community that comes together, we could say, to get closer to what really matters. Uh, and so some people might associate that word with like a religion or some foreign tradition. Um, but actually, there's an amazing, lovely phrase that we have in English, uh, a term coined by Dr. Martin Luther King, that I think is more familiar to us, which is beloved community. Uh, So we could think of Sangha as beloved community. And so there's many different kinds of beloved communities. Uh, But in this case, uh, our beloved community comes together over meditation practice. Uh, And so we come together to practice together and learn from each other. And and that's why we were kind of inspired to use this word that comes from Sanskrit, because that's where a lot of these meditation traditions come from, from South Asia. Well, that's incredible. And you said you you named it this for a very specific reason. So tell us a little bit more about your organization and how its kind of mission is related to bridging the gap between mental health awareness and T1D. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think I started to mention a little bit what we're really up to at the Diabetes Sangha is we want to create both education and kind of community spaces for people to actually learn different meditation practices that could be useful, not only in navigating life with diabetes, but just life in general. And it's funny, Mm -hmm. uh, we start to learn kind of the crossovers between those two. Uh, Of course, all of us living with diabetes know that there's no life with diabetes and, you know, the rest of life, it's all kind of jumbled up and mixed together. Um, But we start to find as we do some of these meditation practices, and we get to learn what's going on in our own minds a little bit more and we get a little better at navigating what kind of crazy headspace can be happening up here for all of us quite normally uh we start to learn oh wait a second this diabetes thing it's actually making me better at life in general uh Mm -hmm. or it can and and you know we can talk a little bit more about that you know for the rest of the conversation but really the idea here is Yes, diabetes is a burden. Diabetes makes everything more difficult. It's true. It's frankly true. Uh, And also, if we can learn to really listen closely to our experience of it, 
uh, and, and pay attention in certain ways to what's going on with our own minds during it, we actually can learn a lot and it gives us a kind of secret leg up. Uh, mm -hmm. That's my theory. That's my theory. So. I like that theory. I subscribe to that theory. I feel like we have superpowers in, in <laughs> different ways, but I, I, I come back to this word stigma too. We talked about it a little bit earlier, but there is a stigma surrounding mental health and even just mentioning it, talking about it and specifically in society, but also in the T1D community. So what, in your opinion, what can we do to kind of raise awareness? Yeah, I mean, so much amazing things have already been said by, by Mark and, and Caitlin. Um, one thing that I just wanted to highlight, a way that I like to contextualize it sometimes, is the amount of really significant life and health decisions that we have to make in a day. So if you think about like, who are the kinds of people that have to make life-changing or life-saving or preserving decisions multiple times a day? Okay, maybe uh, firefighters or people working in an emergency room or soldiers or police officers wow, we know that there's high rates of burnout amidst all of those people, and we naturally understand why. Yeah, of course, those are really serious, extremely stressful jobs and dangerous mm -hmm. jobs in many cases. Uh, and yet we don't think of diabetes as a serious, stressful, and, and dangerous job. And yet, actually, it kind of is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as we start to contextualize it in that way, it's like, oh, wait a second. Of course this is hard. It's supposed to be hard. It was supposed to be hard from the beginning. And so, uh, you know, part of our orientation in these different meditation practices and mindfulness practice in particular is to say, this is hard. And that's true even for people who don't have diabetes, by the way. This thing, this thing we call life is really hard. Particularly this thing we call life with diabetes <laughs> is particularly hard. And so there's nothing wrong with your experience actually quite normal that you're struggling and so that's our starting place and we go from there to say okay so what does that mean and and rather than asking ourselves why which is often not a very fruitful question we can do a lot of mental spinning about this why but we can ask what's really happening right here hmm. and so that's really the core of of a mindfulness practice and that's the core of what we do at diabetes sangha is we just ask in all of these different ways, and in some ways we might explore in a few minutes, we ask, what's really happening here? What's happening here? And we get in touch with it in different ways. And we try to see, how is this impacting what's going on in my mind? What kind of thoughts is this generating? What does this feel like? Mm -hmm. And so as we start to understand a little bit better how our mind works, and we get to see actually both how we're behaving in reaction to everything that's going on, diabetes and not diabetes, we also get a better sense of what's going on with other people. We can look around and start to read them a little bit better as well. Yeah, hmm. yeah that's so good. And I, I love what you said too about kind of the, the hard job that we have. And sometimes it can feel very lonely because when it when we are making those life and death situations like 20 times a day it feels like it's all on us like i know personally that's sometimes how it feels it feels like okay if i don't get this carb count right like i mess this up and now i'm gonna go low and nobody's doing it for me so what role in your opinion does friends families healthcare providers that community that you're kind of building around you play in a part in not only, you know, having Dexcom shared on your phone with my husband, but also just the mental aspect of it as well. Yes. Well, first, I just want to say like community where we can find it is absolutely core. And, and so, you know, not all of us are going to find that in the same way. Like Jordan, I think that's amazing that your husband can look at, at your Dexcom data and, and that that's a good thing for your relationship. I'm like, <laughs> with my partner, I'm like, there is no way that she's going to be looking at my desk. <laughs> uh, I can't even handle my own reactions, much less. Uh, and, and so, you know, we have to manage that and figure out in what ways are we going to find support from others? Um, and certainly I think it's really valuable to seek that out. But I can also say, frankly, I and, and a lot of people I know went a really long time not trying to directly interact with, with other people with 
type one diabetes. I think there's this mm-hmm. idea that we don't want to be defined uh, by living with type one diabetes. And so we might avoid people or, you know, kind of make it a little smaller and put it in the background. Mm-hmm. I think those are actually completely normal responses. Ideally, we can work through those a little bit and, and at least have a couple of kind of confidants and people that we can share this with and, and truly understand. But also, it's, it's important and useful for us to learn a little bit about our own minds so that we can learn what we actually need. Uh, and so as we learn more, what do I actually need in this situation? Man, I am really pissed off. My blood sugars have been high for you know two hours, three hours, four hours. I've been giving insulin. It's not responding. I went for a walk, et cetera. You know the setup. There's this term that I love that maybe many people have heard. It's called rage bullishing. Uh, it's basically that setup where your blood sugars are high and high and high, and then you end up giving too much insulin and, you know, off, off to the, the roller coaster. Right. <laughs> so as you start to get to learn, what are my own needs in each situation, which you can only really learn by getting in touch with what's going on up here and what's going on in your body it actually helps you communicate much better with your community, with others that you care about. Hey, this is what's going on with me right now. Here's what I need from you. Maybe it's don't even say anything at all. Just let me talk mm-hmm. at you. Maybe it's give me some advice because I really, I, I can't do it on my own right now. Um, and maybe it's just sitting silently and just a hug or something like that. But those are things that we also need to learn about ourselves to understand how does this how does this feel right now? What am I really needing? But but I will say just before closing this topic up, you know, we started uh, and and at the very start it was me and, and my friend Brooke Kassoff who started the Diabetes Sangha, and um, we started this organization I think with the idea that oh you know we're going to share all of these amazing meditation practices uh, with people that have been impactful for both of us. Uh, And people seemed to like it and and it was great. And then as we kind of got started having more and more conversations in the midst of these practices, both before and after, hey, what's coming up for you? Uh, I think what all of us started to find was, wow, that was where the the gold really was. It was in hearing and being heard and sharing Mm -hmm. with each other wow, that was a really heartfelt experience, much more than I could have done on my own. And so when you combine those two, when you're able to first understand what's happening here and then use that as a place to connect more deeply, wow, that's a pretty powerful place to be in. Very powerful. Okay, we've hinted at it. Can you please walk us through a mindfulness exercise? Because now I'm getting really excited about this. Okay, okay. All right, hopefully I haven't oversold it. All right. So everybody's going to be in a, a different context right now, but probably most of us are sitting. And so however you're sitting, just bring a little bit of attention to the way that you're sitting. You might more intentionally situate yourself to be relatively still for three or four minutes. And so having done that, if you feel safe and comfortable to do it, you can let your eyes come to rest. And so that might mean closed for some of us, for others, it'll just mean soften your eyes. Notice again what's going on in your body from your head to your toe. Notice what muscles are holding you up, sitting down. Notice what muscles are trying to hold you up and really don't need to be. I don't know about you, but my face seems to always try to help me with my posture. Your face can be relaxed. It doesn't need to help you sit up straight. So letting your face be droopy. Same with your shoulders. Letting your shoulders drop. Just be pulled by gravity. Same with your belly. And if you can, with your hips, just sinking lower, letting gravity pull you.
feeling the pull of gravity from the bottom of your tailbone down towards the center of the earth. That's really gravity, not just your imagination. Let it pull you. And from that place, let's begin to pay attention to our breath. And pay attention in a specific way. Imagining that as you breathe in through your nose, your whole head, imagining your head as a empty shell, just your imagination, your whole head fills up with clear, cool air. And as you exhale, your whole head empties out of air. So imagining you're breathing in, filling your whole head up with air. And as you breathe out, just at your own pace, your head empties out all of the air. One breath at a time, filling up your skull with air, emptying out your skull with air. You might notice thoughts, completely natural normal function of a healthy brain. You don't need to do anything with them. Just continue inhaling, clearing your head, and exhaling, and emptying out the breath. One breath at a time at your own pace. Let's move our attention down to our heart area. You can imagine now that you're breathing into your heart. So as you breathe in, it comes in through your nose and drops through your neck to your heart. And same thing on the way out, out from your heart, out of the nose. One breath at a time. Noticing the warmth and activity of the heart in each inhale as it fills up. Noticing the ease and softness that you might find on an exhale. One breath at a time in and out of the heart, just like this. And finally, dropping your attention even further into your lower belly. Your lower belly doesn't move so much when you breathe, just a little bit. But you can imagine the air coming in through your nose, dropping all the way down to your lower belly, each breath. And softening your whole body with each breath. So you can bring this air down. Thoughts will bring your attention back up to your mind. Completely normal. Just returning to this lower belly. Thoughts can wait, you'll get back to them soon.
And now that you feel ready, you can let go of paying attention to any particular breath in any particular way. And just sit here for a moment and see what happens from your head to your toes, in your mind and outside of your mind. What's happening right now? Just notice. To close, I'll offer a bit of advice that was offered to all of us from somebody from thousands of years ago who said, empty your mind of all thoughts. Let your heart be at peace. Watch the turmoil of all things around you, of the world. But keep your mind on its return to stillness. Immersed in the wonder of this world, you can deal with whatever life brings you. As you're ready, you can take some bigger, deeper breaths. Make some small movements with your feet and your hands, and then maybe some bigger movements. If you're like me, you might try to crack your neck or your back. Those are pretty good ones. As you're ready, you can come back visually if you haven't already, opening your eyes coming back to the screen, perhaps even looking at the room around you for a moment. And I just want to invite everybody as we're starting to come back to join more practices of this kind. Um, we at the Diabetes Sangha, we have numbers of different kinds of meditation practices. So perhaps you didn't like what you just got and uh, you're still interested in trying something different. There's lots of different kinds of meditation practices. And so if you go to the Diabetes Sangha, which you can reach at diabetesangha.com, I'll put it in the comments right now. Oh wait, I don't think I can put it in the comments, but I'll ask that it be put in the comments. Um, so you're going to go to diabetesanga.com and five to six days of the week, we have a session that always free. Uh, you can attend at no cost. You don't need to sign up or anything. Just join on in and uh, we'll be happy to see you and practice with you and hear about your experience. Wow. I need to do that every single day. Um, I feel lighter. Thank you so much for uh, leading us through that. And that was going to be my next question. How can people find you and follow along? So the um, website is in the chat. Thank you so much, Sam, for sharing about the Diabetes Sangha. And I will definitely be signing up because I need more of that in my life. <laughs> Great. I'm excited to see you there, Jordan. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I know I'm speaking for all of you. We all needed that. That I, yes, I'm signing up. Done. Well, that's all that we have today. But what an incredible group. I learned so much. I have all my notes written right here. I feel relaxed. Like, what more could you ask for? Special, special thank you to all of our guests for sharing their stories with us tonight. I also want to give a special, special thank you to our sponsors. I'm going to list them all out. Abbott, Dexcom, Ford, Insulate, Lily, Mankind, Marshalls, Medtronic, Prevention Bio, Splenda, Splenda T3, 
Tandem, Vertex, and Zeras. Thank you. Thank you. You can learn more about the national partners who make the Type 1 Nation Virtual Summit possible and the latest in technology and T1D management at jdrf.org backslash T-O-N Summit. And thanks for all of you for joining us. The comment section was popping. It was a party in there. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories in the comments. I hope that you found that this was a community. Make sure to come back and visit us again. If you haven't already done so, please go to jdrf.org slash T-O-N Summit and register for the series because you do not want to miss our final session of the year of 2023 on World Diabetes Day, November 14th. We will be focusing on T1D across the globe. So stay tuned for more information on that. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your host. It has been so much fun. I always learn so much every single time I host these. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good night.